Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia. Today I am chatting to Elia, who is in Sudan. Hello Elia. Hi Risha, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for having a chat to me today. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you about your experiences out there in Sudan um, and where you're working and um, some of the challenges and things that you've faced in working with children with clubfoot. But before we do that, um, maybe you could just introduce yourself to people that haven't met you before. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from and uh, what you get up to for work out there. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Elia Bernabeu Mira. I'm a Spanish physiotherapist. I'm a Catalan physiotherapist, actually. Um, and I've been working in uh, development countries for many years, uh, in Asia, in Africa and in Latin America. I worked uh, not always on club food. I worked in a diversity of settings, but uh, I do have a soft spot for club food. I really like it. And um, and mainly that's it. I'm here working for the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I work both uh, with amputee rehabilitation and um, a club food project. Okay, so you're in a, are you in a ICRC physical rehabilitation center? In... Uh, we do the, t here we, we have two projects. So one is a, um, uh, is a project uh, that supports technically uh, a center from the government. That is an orthopedic center uh, for, for orthotics and prosthetics. Um, and it's, it's run by the government and we give technical support. And then we are also supporting um, an organization, a local organization that works mainly in pediatry. And there is where they, we work supporting the Club Food Project. Okay, what's the name of that organization? Is it a local one or a...? Uh, it's a Cheshire Homa. So it used to be, uh, it, it is still a part of the network of uh, Cheshire Homes, but uh, yeah, they work uh, now locally. Okay, great. And so you, do you work mainly with individuals with clubfoot or are you, do you spread your time across all the programs that you work with? I, uh, we, we, spread, we are two physiotherapists and we spread our time between the prosthetics and orthotics and the clubfoot. Okay, okay. So I'm interested to talk to you about the club foot side of things today. Um, you, can you tell us a little bit about the club foot program that you have there, um, how it works, how it was set up? Um, just give us a little bit of sort of an insight into, into how, how the club foot clinic works with you. Sure. We are uh, working in a center that has very comprehensive services, which is very, very um, pleasant. So we have a doctor setting, physiotherapy, we have a theater, so it's possible to have also tenotomies on place. There is dormitories for families that go, come from, from outside the state. And there is also, um, I'm really sorry, there is also a workshop where there is a shoe department where they um, produce locally the foot abduction braces. So actually every part of the, of the treatment is taken care locally and in one place. So it's, it's quite, it's quite, that is very uh, interesting because we can, like families doesn't have to pilgrim uh, around the services to get the service, the full service, but they get everything here. And um, that is uh, certainly very interesting. And it's also um, very challenging because we have to, well, we are working on all the components a little bit uh, to improve it. So it's also very broad, but, but at the same time, very interesting. And we can really follow the children from A to Z and, um, and see the big differences they make. Okay. So let's talk about the kind of the children that you see. How far do they have to travel to see you? So what sort of area do you cover? Um, are you... Uh, are there other clinics in the country that um, people can go to or is it just you or what's the situation? So we are working actually with the only uh, place that is uh, doing the full treatment and is um, affordable. There is one or two uh, private uh, clinics that do part of the treatment and it's very expensive. So actually we are the only centre and here is where we would enter in, um, in challenges. Um, because uh, we treat uh, around 300 kids per year, which means that we estimate it's around 10, 15% of the kids born uh, every year in the country, which means that 85% of the kids are not treated at all or are badly treated, 
like a lot of them go through a lot of them some of them that i've seen in the countryside uh, they come with uh, big operations and afos and afos and you see the feet and it's not very very nice okay so how far do people travel to see you do they um are they is it just the local children locally or do they come from further afield we have quite some people coming from Khartoum city because it's already a big city and there is a lot of uh, cases and uh, I have to say that they come very early which is very motivating they come like after three days with the grandmother because the mother is still in bed so it's really re that is really nice it's very good and uh, but we do have people coming from um, Nyala from Darfur it's not uh, it's not the majority at all, and we slowly would like to get more um, outside, um, but uh, it's not the majority. So majority is clearly Khartoum city and and the the surroundings. But we do have some some users coming from farther away that get referred and um, get get treatment. It's also the biggest percentage of um, people that doesn't adhere to the full treatment because it's it's longer and it's a lot of up and down and um, it's also the most the people that has more barriers to access to 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 complete the treatment but yeah we are uh, working on it yeah so okay so some of the challenges we've already talked about that you experience one is obviously people getting to your clinic and and the uh, lack of clinics in in sudan um uh, and that sort of is is obvious and makes sense really but then the adherence is is naturally quite a, an issue isn't it so what sort of things are you are you working on to try and overcome those challenges those that you face with getting your patients to adhere to their treatment yeah well this year we are trying to upgrade the technical capacities a bit for instance uh, we are trying to make sure we can produce more shoes so we can access more children because if you cannot produce more shoes you don't need to access more children eh? so we are trying to build up on, on the capacities to be able to do the the other step next year that is to uh, find ways to access more children so right now what we are doing is really like building up on capacities and uh, making sure that we are ready for that step where we were not and it's not good neither that we get a lot of children referred and we are not ready to answer to those, no. So we are we are still um, on heavily on training and uh, building capacities. So with the building capacity, you you talk about um, you have a bracing centre there where you produce all the braces locally and things. Is that a sort of normal yeah. situation, or have you set that up yourselves to to sort of combat that issue of of getting the resources? Yeah, actually, they they were already produced. There was already a shoe department. It's not, um, and on top is run with uh, quite a lot of disabled people, and it's very interesting. But uh, they were not producing the the foot abduction brace as a foot abduction brace. So that the only thing that uh, my colleague before me did was to to improve. I mean, to to set up what the foot abduction brace is and uh, how it should be done properly. We still have challenges there. We are still um, undergoing um, upgrading and trainings. We are not fully happy with our braces, but we are very happy on, on the costs. And, um, and they, they, they um, actually, we, uh, the children fit in it. <laughs> and the, the results of our children uh, is very good. So. Yeah, I mean, it must be really good that you can you have that uh, access to those services locally and that they're produced locally and you can work on mm -hmm. and do the training and you know work on developing the braces that you you need to use with the children that you're working with yeah yeah yeah. we were extremely lucky it, it was it's it's an it's an association that has 40 years of experience and they they were supported by many other NGOs before, uh, so they had a lot ready, a lot of capacities when we started working with them on the Ponsetti treatment. Uh, so they, we were very lucky on that sense. Uh, you're right. Okay, and so so when when do you find that the problems with adherence start to appear in in your service users? Yeah, well, last year we did make a survey because we we started to understand that there was some children that were missing appointments. And uh, we organized, we contacted the social work department and we organized uh, a survey. 
And it was very interesting because actually there was two main causes. One was that they didn't understood. They were saying, no, but the fit is okay here. So actually it was some things that we could improve as a service. And we made the strategy to improve the communication to families. And then the, the other uh, cause of stopping was uh, transport, accessibility, uh, rainy season, all these uh, more um, accessibility causes that are, and those were not all not from Khartoum. So as I was telling you, is this is these people that did does find out, does try to make an effort to come and do the first steps, but eventually because it's a long treatment, and it, is, it takes really years no, to come up and down. Uh, eventually, there is a moment where they, when they find that the fit is more or less okay, they, they give up. Um, it, yeah, which, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I guess that comes back to the communication side of things, doesn't it? And, um, uh, and, uh, and the educating the families more and, th and things like that, which it seems like you, you know, you've identified that as one of, one of the issues and, and are addressing that. So that's a good yeah. thing. Have you, I mean, that sort of thing, we know once we find out it's a problem, it is easy to address with the communication and educational resources and things like that. Is there any way that you've been able to overcome any of the transport issues? No, I um, I wanted to go back to the communication to explain to you that we're starting uh, mothers' groups and we find it very interesting, um, especially because one of the mothers that is facilitating is one that uh, had a relapse because she's, she stopped the braces. So it's it's very, uh, we are finding it very useful to that she speaks to the other mothers and kind of explains what can happen if you stop and it's not me explaining but another mother and she comes with the child that now is a zero zero running around the room all the time with very nice fit so it's very encouraging and it's very um, positive for the mothers to listen to the stories and for the fathers the ones that accept to come because also sometimes are not the most difficult to convince and um, the other thing was that just by doing the survey and showing it to the physios, we find it out that they spend much more time explaining. And to overcome it, so I find that spending time looking at what are the problems of people is helping a lot uh, to improve it. Um, for transport, uh, we are right now doing the strategy for next year and we will have a lot of uh, things um, we are going to try to support the families and um, as we also have a dormitory and a better support them for transport and accommodation, but I cannot uh, specify now because it's not there yet. We are working on that. Yeah, the, um, the communication side of things is really interesting. Having a mother's group, um, uh, that must make such a difference to have mothers talking to each other, I think, um, on a peer to peer mm -hmm. kind of basis. And and also it's really interesting that you say that just doing the survey and finding out what the problems were that when the physios, other physiotherapists or other healthcare professionals are aware of that, that their practice changes as well. So that's quite interesting um, and, and very motivating to um, know that you can make a difference just by simply more education, that sort of thing. Um, really, really yeah. interesting. Um, the transport side of things, it's always a challenge, isn't it? And I think everyone in in a sort of less resource setting always faces those challenges. And maybe not in just less resource settings, but in all settings in developing developed countries as well. Um, because, and it, and it is mainly because the treatment is such a long treatment, isn't it? Um, okay. Many, many years. Um, yeah. <clears throat> are there any... Um, are there any other challenges that you have faced as a service or as a clinic or, or as an individual that you think are sort of key to um, really helping individuals, individual children with club foot or anything, or, or indeed as a, as a service, as providing a service? Mm. Um, no, I mean, in, in other projects, there was always the, like lack of tenotomies or lack of uh, braces. Here, here um, we have the luck that we have everything under under the same roof, so we don't we don't have all these problems. Um, no, I would say that uh, frequently what we also find is that there is very few professionals that know um, 
And so there is a limited capacity also. That's why right now we are working on upgrading so we can access more children. Because right now there is like six physios that does it well, only like, you know, like four shoemakers. So they ha if they have to produce double, they, they, they need like to work better or to train more people. So I think the capacities, the local capacities is also a challenge sometimes. Not because they, they are not trained, but because they are not trained on Ponseti. And uh, unfortunately, also, I think what is really a challenge, but is the basic of everything, is that it's not in the in the health coverage. You know, it's not like compared to to the, to the in the developing countries. If you are lucky to work in a place when there is a health package, it's not in the package. If there is a health package, so I think there is a lot of advocacy to do too to make sure that is taken is understood that uh, we are preventing disability and the, the importance of club food uh, treatment um, with the governments and the structures. Yeah, so is that advocacy at a like, uh, sort of government level to train, change strategies at a, at a, I guess at a national level, really? Yeah. And do you do quite a lot of work on that side of things? No, right now we are not doing. Um, I think there is uh, when there is uh, the Global Club Food uh, Initiative that uh, is is preparing things, and uh, we are. Uh, but here we are not doing that yet. But for sure there is the need to do it. Eh? But there is also we also have limited capacities. <laughs> we cannot stretch everywhere, and we we try to do uh, what what on the parcels we can. Uh, but we it's true that uh, there is a huge need on that. Um. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully everyone, if anyone doing this course or watching this video would like to get involved and go and help you, Elia, in Sudan, <laughs> I'm sure you'd welcome them. <laughs> um, and again, I guess, and in, in if you can't, if we can't go and help you um, sort of locally in your setting, there is al always this advocacy um, kind of um, approach that anyone can take from wherever they are in the world can't they so if we can just do more to raise awareness of clubfoot and the difference that the appropriate management techniques can make and that clinics like yours or services like yours are making then then the more that government level governments or sort of um management levels are aware of that then and and how much we can prevent disability um, in children and obviously for the rest of their lives, then then that should really make make a difference as well. So I think I do think that advocacy thing is something that we can do from wherever we are in the world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, I think when you explain well, club food, everybody falls in love with it. You know, it's so magical. No, it's uh, it's like. I think being a physiotherapist, it's one of these few things you do that really has a huge, massive impact on life of people and and um, and really, really change the future of these kids. And I think the problem is that it's not, I think it's not well, it's not always enough explained and uh, it's it's not always enough known uh, by, by these people who take decisions. So I completely agree that much more uh, advocacy from everywhere would help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Elia, you seem to have worked in quite a few settings with uh, and with Clubfoot and with other um, conditions in your setting. Um, have you got any particular advice for other physiotherapists around the world in sort of the more developing settings to help uh, run or manage or set up this kind of service for children with Clubfoot? Anything, you know, anything that that you can think of that would really from your experience would really help others who are trying who are who are facing quite a few challenges in in running this kind of service yeah well i remember when i started i downloaded uh, the ponsetti book i had no clue uh, we get i got no no training on that when i was at the school so i arrived in a country and i started seeing children like this you know and i was uh, so i think the treatment I would encourage people to really follow the MOOC <laughs> because actually I did a lot of mistakes and the treatment of uh, club food is actually quite simple, um, but you need to understand it well and to follow it very straight. And one of the magics it has also is that it's not, it's, it's always ABC, let's say. I don't want to simplify it, but it's not like a cerebral palsy, which every kid is different and it's a whole world. Club food, I mean, there is children that are difficult and go out from this from the scheme, but more or less, it's always the same treatment and it's not complicated. You just need to get the proper treatment, the, the proper training to do it well. And I, uh, when I started, I didn't have the proper training. 
I was not in the ICRC, I have to say. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I just downloaded the book and I started and I slowly, slowly learned. But now there is much more resources that was 15 years ago that now there is much, much more resources. And uh, I think this MOOC is incredible. It's an incredible opportunity for a lot of physios to learn very well the treatment because it's not very complicated and it's very, I would not say rigid, but it's very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and so having the so from a course like this one, having like the base knowledge and doing all the reading, the background reading, and understanding all the theory behind everything before you can try and go somewhere to do some actual practical sk skills training um, is mm -hmm. is a good way to start out, isn't it? But um, the practical skills training, um, you know, where can mm -hmm. people? How do people sort of go about that? Is it? Uh, have you got any advice for people on on how to get um, confident with their practical skills? I would definitely, for the plastering especially, I would definitely try to look at the Ponseti International or try to find the, the local practitioner closer to you that knows how to do it. And um, because, well, again, I don't know you, but I didn't plaster ever in my life before, like Physiotherapies in these countries, they plaster. I never plastered before. So I didn't knew how to do a normal plaster neither. So in Spain, it's not part of the curriculum or it was not at the time. So I, I had to start from zero learning how to use plaster. So I think I, I would I would recommend go to your uh, go to the closest um, because it's not that complicated. Actually, it's quite simple. You just need to spend some time with somebody that knows it. But sometimes means it's not like Sometimes, I mean a week, huh? it's not a very long process where because it's more or less always the same and it's not, but you really need to put the fingers correctly and it's very um, accurate. So I'm not saying it's super easy, but it's, 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 not, it's not very long to learn it. So I would, I, would, I would recommend first people to really learn the process well. Um, and, uh, and follow the MOOC or download materials and learn. Uh, and then go to, to the closest practitioner that is doing it and learn um, and learn how to do it. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And it's nice to hear that, you know, if you can just get like a week's work experience with your local practitioner, then that's going to be enough, isn't it, for you to be able to make a difference yeah. to, ch to children. Yeah, so that's good. Um, good. Well, um, is there anything else that you think is important that knowledge or experience that you have that you'd like to share with everyone um, that might be watching this video? No, I think I think um, no. I was gonna say to be really like passionate about it, but I think everybody who starts working on club food becomes a fan of it uh, so it's a bit of uh, empty uh, advice because it will happen anyway it will trap you anyway and um no i would say really look for resources knock doors people people is very happy to to help you know to to teach you to to accompany you you are not alone because what happens a lot in these countries is that you feel a bit lonely you know, you are there uh, with no nobody to ask questions. Um, frequently in projects, physiotherapy is one. You know, like in many, it's not it's not the main core of the project. You are um, one, and uh, you don't have necessarily all the skills or the expertise or the material. Or and so yeah, look for doors, uh, annoy people, ask. <laughs> I that's what I did uh, and. Uh, some of them didn't answer, and some of them answered, and I, and I learned. So I would I would recommend people to not be shy and to and to be very curious about it, and um, and then also to to work a lot with the families. No, I uh, I am a big fan of uh, of us. We were discussing at the beginning um, upgrading the technical skills for sure, but also work with the families, make sure they are on board in club foot. I mean, they are the ones doing the bracing at home. So they are in charge of most of a big part of the treatment. So they really need to be on board. They really need to be with you. And you have to work a lot on that. Yeah, no, I think that's all good advice. Uh, it's been really good to talk to you. I think the conversation about adherence and the challenges you've faced and how you've overcome those have been excellent. And also your 
uh, advice about working with the families is massive I think um, and I and from talking to people in in development of this course we hear that a lot and and that seems to make quite a lot of difference when the families are on board and you know it is a it's a group effort isn't it from a whole whole group of people um, and the families are very important so um it's been great to talk to you today, Elia. You're, you're just hearing your experiences and your advice to people, others out there who um, are working towards improving their skills and knowledge for working with children with Clubfoot. It's really good. Um, so thanks so much for talking to us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear about all your experiences. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been very nice talking to you too. Okay, thank you. Bye.